morning. This session is to discuss the dynamics of water and soils, often called soil water movement. We'll be using some of the concepts that we've covered in the last couple of lectures uh, to do with soil water retention, particularly those related to soil water potentials. And so this is where we're heading in this lecture. We've actually already covered soil water potentials last lecture. So what we'll go on to do is look at pore size and water movement. And so we understand pore size a little bit from uh, discussion of soil water retention. And we'll also look at uh, what we call hydraulic conductivity, that how fast water moves through soil and what the controls are that on that are. Then discuss infiltration, and finally we'll get to another water-related soil issue, and that's the idea of soil salinity. And so there are some learning outcomes that you should take note of for this lecture, and they're on LMS as well. So just to get back to our soil hydrology diagram where we finished off last time, we remember that if we take the soil as the component of an ecosystem that we're interested in. There are inputs into that system and outputs of water and there is a balance so we can account for what's going in and what's coming out if we make the right sort of measurements and the amount in the soil should relate to the balance between the inputs and outputs and one of the main inputs and output pairs that we consider is the balance between infiltration, that's water percolating into the soil and being stored at least temporarily in the soil system and surface runoff where water doesn't infiltrate the soil and escapes from the soil system by running off over the land onto another part of the landscape potentially into streams and rivers where it's lost from the terrestrial system. So Soil water potentials, which we looked at last time, help us understand where water moves. So water will move, for example, towards lower matrix potential. So small pores that are not yet full of water, well, water will tend to move into those. Water will move to dilute salt. Water will move in the direction of a gravitational gradient, either in soils that are saturated above field capacity or when a soil is flooded. We talked about those pressure and gravitational potentials as well as osmotic and matrix potentials. Now, water movement in soils is related to the size of pores, but also how connected they are and the, therefore their length of flow paths. And so we're going to look at a couple of ways in which we deal with that from a theoretical basis and then go on to look at maybe more of the practical outcomes of that. First, have a look at this graph here. So what we've got here is a measure of how fast the water moves through the soil, which we call the hydraulic conductivity, and we'll come to that in a minute, against suction or the negative of matrix potential. So we understand this at low values of suction or pressure applied then we have more water in soil and less water in soil at high pressures or um, high negative matrix potentials. Okay, so uh, what we see in this case is not a water retention curve or something a bit different. This relates to the rate of water movement through, this, through the soil. And so for a saturated soil where our suction is minus 0.1 kPa, and that's the value that you used in the lab for soil saturation, we can see that uh, sandy loam soil conducts water more quickly, has higher hydraulic conductivity than a clay soil. In fact, it's about 10 times as much because this vertical scale is a log scale, just like the suction scale is. And when the soil is reasonably wet, when it gets to about field capacity, uh, and, sorry, until it gets to about field capacity, then the sandy loam has higher conductivity. But there is an, an unusual phenomenon here in that the clay seems to have higher hydraulic conductivity than the sand, even though the clay is probably finer and has got a much higher proportion of smaller pores. And that's kind of a, a clue about what's going on. 
because the clay having a higher proportion of smaller pores at higher suctions of course most of the pores in a sandy loam will be empty and that means it won't conduct water and there's no connectivity of the water between pores because by and large the pores have air in them instead of water at moderate suctions for a sandy loam soil whereas for a clay because it has a larger proportion a lot of its total pore volume in small pores it will actually even though the conductivities are low it will have a greater rate of water movement through it than for a sandy loam or sandy soil okay now we're going to unpack some of those ideas as we go so remember this idea of hydraulic conductivity the rate of water movement through a soil and what we've seen here Quite clearly, it seems to relate to pore size and also the number of pores. So one of the first theoretical things that we need to consider is how pore radius or pore geometry affects the rate of flow. And the theory behind this is called Purcell's law. What we see here is a plot of uh, our radius basically in water velocity uh, or radial position uh, and what we notice is that in small pores then the velocity of water flow so velocity flow would be like length per time kind of like a water depth say millimeters of water per hour or per minute um, is proportional to the square of the radius okay so what that means is that if we halve the pore size, then we decrease water velocity by, a, uh, it goes down to a quarter, all right? Because two squared is four. All right, now, and the equation for Poisson's law is shown here on the right, where the small q flux in depth per time is proportional to the radius of the pore squared multiplied by the difference in pressure so the, basically the hydraulic gradient which we'll come to in more detail in a minute um, and there's some other factors in the equation as well uh, the length of flow and the viscosity of the fluid all right but the important thing for us to note is this r squared term so uh, our water flux in terms of length per time millimeters per hour is proportional to the square of the pore radius but if we think about the volume of water that's transferred okay um, then our flow becomes different so big q flux q w meaning water flux uh, is proportional to the fourth power of the pore radius meaning that if we halve the pore radius we will get one sixteenth of the volume of water flowing through and that's related to both the inability of a smaller pore to carry a large volume but also because of frictional effects of the water on the sides of the pore and so forth okay the upshot of this is that the flow is very very dependent on pore radius and that's one of the things that we need to consider. Large pores conduct water much, much more easily than small pores do because of the implications of Poisson's law. All right, so that's one thing. The other thing is, uh, I guess, more generic than that. So there's a, a law that's often used to describe the flow of fluids in what we call porous media. So soil is a porous medium so uh, fractured rocks so is um, i guess a, a pool filter is a porous medium so uh, darcy back in the day um, did an experiment using a soil column and it had a particular hydraulic conductivity which we give the symbol k subscript s or sometimes k subscript sat meaning saturated hydraulic conductivity and it had well-defined dimensions this column it had a flow length for the water of l 
and a cross-sectional area of A. Well, we're getting somewhere with this, don't worry. Um, and water was applied to the column. And you'll notice that the height of water at the column inlet, which is here, is higher than at the outlet. So that creates our hydraulic gradient, which is driving water flow. So we've actually got a pressure potential difference, P1 over here and P2 over here, right? And what Darcy found was that the volume flow was quite predictable. Okay, so volume flow Q, big Q, is equal to the hydraulic conductivity times the area times the difference in pressure and all that divided by the column length, right? Uh, and we can express this in another way, that big Q again. So hydraulic conductivity times area times delta P, which is just our difference in pressure. Delta P is P1 minus P2, again, divided by L. And the important parameter here is the saturated hydraulic conductivity, our K subscript S value. And that will vary for different soils. Okay. Everything else could be the same, but we'll get different conductivities for different soils, not because of differences in pressure gradient or area or length, but because of hydraulic conductivity. And hydraulic conductivity is largely governed by soil texture, so the grain sizes, and the, which controls the pore sizes between them, and of course structure, so aggregates controlling the occurrence of larger pores within the soil. Right, we can look at that a couple of ways. Um, so the the, the length-based flux of water looks a little bit different. Um, water flux density is our velocity, if you like, um, meters per second or millimeters per hour or whatever. Um, but what we're usually interested in is volume. But in some cases, particularly when we measure things like infiltration in the field, it may be a lot easier to look at, at a velocity-based thing. So millimetres, what we measure rainfall in per time. Right? But this is the form of the Darcy equation that we usually use. Okay. So that would be for our length-based measurement. On the previous page, where we use big Q flux, the measurement is... Uh, needs to include the cross-sectional area which is flown through but of course if we have rainfall or some water quantity measured in a depth that's independent of area a millimeter over a hectare is the same amount of rainfall as a millimeter over a square centimeter you might want to think about that okay so the Apart from the pressure head and the length of the flow path, the important thing to be concerned about is uh, hydraulic conductivity. Now, what I will say about Tarsi's law is that it does seem to work reasonably well for saturated flow, uh, but in soils, it doesn't always hold. Uh, and that's because of the issue of unsaturated flow and the fact that what we call macropores, so old root channels or earthworm burrows or termite burrows or something like that, are really, really dominant in determining the rate of water flow through real field soils. So Darcyan flow may not occur. Uh, we may get what we call non-Darcyan flow, or, uh, sometimes called macropore flow, occurring in real field soils. But let's pretend, if you like, that Darcy's law is good, and it does enable us to predict many things. It's very useful, uh, for example, sometimes for groundwater flow uh, and for the flow of water in saturated soils, even in the field. So, as I said, the main controller, one of them, in controlling hydraulic conductivity, which is our main variable, if you like, and uh, considering Darcy's law is dependent on soil texture. So our hydraulic conductivity in what we call coarse textured soils, gravels and sands, is very, very high. Um, this table calls it excessive, whatever that means, um, and high and decreasing as the texture becomes finer. So in a clay soil, our hydraulic conductivity is uh, 10 to the minus 7 to 10 to the minus 9. Well, compare that with our gravel 
that's about a million times lower hydraulic conductivity in a clay than in a gravel. And if the clay is poorly structured, compacted in some way, then it may be another 100 times slower than that. So a poorly structured clay would have a hydraulic conductivity about 100 million times slower than a gravel or about 100,000 times slower or more than uh, for a sand. So what we see is, uh, and this is a different way of showing the same sort of information, um, is that infiltration, so water which is on the surface of the soil, infiltrating into the surface, so when we have some sort of flooding occurring, we see the same sort of effect in that the the slope of these lines represents our hydraulic conductivity and a clay soil has a much lower slope than our gravelly sandy loam or sandy loam and so on. Uh, different management might have different effects on hydraulic conductivity as well. So the sandy loam appears three times in this diagram under pasture or mulched, which might be in a horticultural situation or in a cropping situation. The continued cultivation during cropping tends to reduce porosity um, and therefore decrease hydraulic conductivity. In a pasture soil, uh, there doesn't tend to be so much compaction, certainly not from vehicles and things. Uh, the root systems of at least perennial pastures, which is true for McLaren and Cameron's examples because they come from New Zealand where perennial pastures uh, are a big deal. Um, and that sort of thing you know, allows earthworms to thrive and other sorts of uh, mesofauna in soils and it creates porosity, which gives a higher hydraulic conductivity than in cropping soils. And as we decrease uh, the average pore size in our soils, we're decreasing hydraulic conductivity. The other thing that we should notice about this particular plot is that the slope of that line is not constant. So the hydraulic conductivity or the infiltration rate seems to be a bit faster at the beginning. Uh, and that's uh, when water is sitting above a, an unsaturated soil. Basically, there are, there's more than one type of potential causing the water to enter the soil at the beginning. Uh, and when it reaches a constant slope, that's when it's saturated. But before the soil is saturated, of course, we've got gravitational and pressure potential uh, driving the water down into the soil, but also the matrix potential exerted by the dry soil underneath, all right? and potentially a small amount of osmotic potential as well uh, if there's salts in the soil. So um, we see that infiltration rates generally, not always, um, decrease to a constant value over time. So if this is the amount of infiltration uh, and the uh, horizontal axis is minutes, then the rate, the depth per time, is the slope of these lines. All right. Now this is quite important um, when we go back and have a look at our water balance here, right? Because if the balance between infiltration and runoff is important, and we'll show you why in a minute, then it's highly dependent also on soil texture and structure. All right, let's move on a little bit. And this is one of the reasons why the balance between infiltration and runoff is important, because um, sometimes rainfall can be very intense. And in fact, the rainfall rate can be higher than the rate, the maximum rate of infiltration into a soil. And if that happens, we get erosion uh, uh, of soil material because of water flowing over the surface downhill, which leads to deposition further down. And this actually happened uh, on a farm near Baker's Hill. A very intense summer thunderstorm uh, eroded quite a bit of material from the mid and upper slopes and deposited it um, you know, up to 10 or 20 centimetres deep further down the slope. So soil structure is also important, as we saw implied before in the table, for affecting infiltration. And some of the, the issues that we might see might look something like this. So th there's a phenomenon called hard setting, where if we have a poorly structured clay soil and um, that structure in the dry soil uh, can set quite hard, um, 
give us very hard clods, and this is what we'd call a massive structured uh, topsoil here, and that can decrease infiltration. And from what we've seen uh, about what causes soil structure or the lack of it, that's probably in many cases caused by the phenomenon of sodicity. So too much sodium instead of calcium on what we call colloids or fine, usually clay particles and soils. Remember that too much sodium means that the swarm of cations around clay crystals is quite large and they tend to repel each other uh, and not aggregate together. And then, so we get this massive structure forming in uh, quite thick layers on the surface of the soil. This is about 25 centimetres thick, uh, but it can also form what we call a thin surface crust. So again, a surface crust caused by sodicity, too much sodium instead of ions like calcium attracted to clays. There are a couple of things that might happen if that occurs. First of all, um, it will favour runoff, so we may get topsoil loss, which actually we don't want to do because a lot of the fertility in our soils is in the topsoil. That's where the organic matter is and a lot of the nutrition and nutrient cycling goes on there. Our microbial population, as Louise will tell you later, lives there and so on. And there are some other effects that might occur too. Uh, seedlings, obviously, if the seed is planted below the soil surface, they need to pop up above the soil surface. If there's a surface crust, it has more strength than a structured soil uh, and less natural porosity. So we can get suppression of seedling emergence and therefore lower crop yields as a result. Generally, these sort of structural problems are much more of an issue for managed systems such as agriculture and horticulture than they are for natural systems. The other main soil property that might affect infiltration rates is something that we also had a look at in the field, and that's water repellents. So water repellents is caused mainly in sandy soils. In fact, it doesn't really occur in clay soils because of the uh, large negative matrix potentials exerted by the pores between clay grains. Uh, but in sand, with those matrix potential effects are not so strong, then the existence of waxy, oily type organic coatings on sand grains can make them hydrophobic or water repellent. And that obviously is something that decreases infiltration. Water can just sit on the soil surface and not soak in. Soaking in effectively is infiltration. Right, so we're going to move topic now and talk about salinization. Uh, many of you will have covered the phenomenon of soil salinization, particularly from land clearing, which we call dry land salinization or secondary salinization. Uh, you may have covered that already in school or in previous units. So here's just a quick reminder of how it happens. Okay, so let's think of the, the situation before clearing um, agricultural land. We have a a reasonably good cover of a woodland or a shrubland, perennial plants, which in the case of native Australian plants are quite deep rooted. And the fact that they use water all year round and their roots occupy a large volume of the subsurface, that means they can use a lot of water. So a lot of the rainfall falling onto this landscape is then recycled through evapotranspiration in the plants and goes back into the atmosphere. And therefore the amount of recharge of groundwater is quite minimal, maybe half a millimetre to five millimetres per year. Actually, in some parts of arid Australia, there's what we call negative recharge. So the evapotranspiration actually exceeds uh, precipitation. We may get a little bit of recharge over the winter months uh, in where well, we have transient um, higher infiltration than uh, we do uh, evapotranspiration. Anyway, the rate of groundwater recharge is very slow. Now that's important because in many parts of Australia, the groundwater deeper in the regolith or deep, deeply weathered soil environments is actually saline. So we don't want that groundwater to come close to the surface because then uh, our plants will experience the saltiness of that groundwater and that won't be a good thing. Okay. Now, 
if we clear the land though, what we've done is replace these perennial deep rooted plants with short lived shallow rooted plants so that they're not actually able to use as much of the water that falls on that landscape through rainfall or other precipitation. Right? So the recharge can increase by a hundredfold, um, but you know, typically maybe 10 to 30 fold. Right? What that means is that after a decade or a few decades, the groundwater will rise enough to start to affect the roots of these plants. And it means that the plants don't grow so well. We get even less water use by the plants and therefore more recharge. And the low lying areas on the surface of the land become salinized or saline. So we can measure that in the field through very high EC values, say above 500 microsiemens per centimeter in a one to five extract, All right? So what we see is that we need to take into account the inputs of water, rainfall, run on and irrigation, uh, and the outputs. So evapotranspiration being the dominant one, but also recharge of groundwater, runoff and soil water. So what, what we're really interested in, in the salinity story is the amount of recharge. And if we change the inputs, then we will probably change the outputs, right? Uh, and they need to balance. So if we decrease evapotranspiration um, and the outputs need to still somehow match the inputs, then one of these or more of these things will increase recharge, runoff and change in soil water content. And often uh, a component of that at least, if not mo most of it, is expressed in recharge and therefore the groundwater rises and we get secondary salinity. Uh, the forecasts for salinisation in Australia are pretty dire. And unfortunately, our part of Australia and Western Australia is going to be predicted to be the hardest hit. Uh, in 2050, up to half of the soil in our wheat belt may become affected by dryland salinity. And that's not that far away. 2050 is 20-something you know, years away. Uh, can't do maths. 31 years away give or take. All right. So you have learned how to measure salinity in soil. Uh, we make in the field, it's a fairly approximate one to five extract and we dip our electrode in and we measure usually in micro siemens per centimeter, the concentration of salts indirectly in the soil by measuring their electrical conductivity. Okay. Um, now, between zero and 200, we've got a, a fairly small amount of soluble salt in the soil, but where the values start to affect plant growth around the 400 to 800 microsiemens per centimetre mark, we've got above 0.1% salt uh, in our soil, and that's starting to become an issue. Right. Um, okay, so that's pretty self-explanatory. And there are only a few types of plant that can survive in soils which are highly saline. There's an approximate conversion if you need one, that total dissolved solids or approximate percentage of soluble salt in soil, same thing, is about 0.5 to 0.6 multiplied by electrical conductivity. Right, so different water sources have different salinities. So if we go with units that we're familiar with, EC and micro siemens per centimetre. Seawater is obviously pretty high. Um, it's salty, uh, it has a conductivity of about 63,000 micro siemens per centimetre. Perth water supply, not that flash actually, somewhere between 200 and 1,000 micro siemens per centimetre straight out of the tap. Um, fortunately, you can only start to taste it when it's about 1,800 micro siemens per centimetre. Um, and for human health, we try to keep it below about two and a half thousand micro siemens per centimeter, but preferably below uh, 900. We can actually observe higher conductivities than that in very saline areas in one to five soil. Some of our groundwaters in Western Australia are what we call hypersaline, meaning they're more salty than the sea by some in some cases considerable amounts. 
Right. So what is salinity? Well, in, in southwest Western Australia and many other parts of the world, it's dominated by common salt or sodium chloride or halite for you geologists out there. Um, so in, in the Yilgran Craton, um, so the geological area that makes up most of southwest and western Australia, we see a range of uh, chloride concentrations, for example, from 4,000 to 12,000, which is around the seawater uh, value parts per million and this is near Baker's Hill so we've all been to Baker's Hill right and had a pie there or something um, the groundwater in that area is pretty saline and it uh, can also be acidic or alkaline um, in Baker's Hill it tends to be fairly acidic and that may be due to oxidation of uh, sulfides which are sporadically present in the underlying uh, rock units or some other mechanism um, related to iron reduction and oxidation and cycling through that many times. Uh, and there, of course, there are other things present in the groundwater. So if we have a look at the composition, um, the important things are the salinity, obviously, they're the, the ions that are present in much higher concentrations where we have high sulfate that can represent uh, our sulfide oxidation type things uh, but the other things are just from really weathering and dissolution of rock materials apart from the ph which at yallenby which is a well was a csro farm near baker's hill um, there was quite acidic groundwater how does the salt get there well that's a really good question um, one of the main mechanisms is through actually through rainfall so obviously when water evaporates from the sea it, the salt doesn't evaporate as well, but that's not the only way in which rainfall is made. Uh, we get aerosols, so when w wind or wave action whips up fine droplets from uh, the surface of the ocean, then that can form part of clouds as well, and that contains a bit of salt. So right at the coast, we can get 200 kilograms of salt per hectare every year, uh, just coming in from marine sources. And the, the lines that you see on the 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 map here are kind of line contours of salt deposition. So along the southern coastal plain in the Capes area, that's where we're getting our 200 kilograms per hectare per year. And Perth, we're getting about 100 kilograms of salt every year per hectare of land. Uh, but in the agricultural region, about 10 to 50 kilograms per hectare per year, depending on whether we're on the western or eastern margin. So if, if we take a guesstimate that our landscape has been stable for about 30 million years, then the gross salt accumulation, um, not accounting for any losses through rivers and things, is huge. It's about 900,000 tonnes for every hectare of land. I mean, mind-boggling amounts of salt. The estimates that we have is that there are actually about 50 to 10,000 tonnes of salt uh, per hectare stored in the regolith, so the weathered material below our soils. And obviously that depends on where we are in the landscape. Sometimes the regolith is intact, so it's very deep and we can store lots of salt, and sometimes it's quite shallow where it's been eroded away and we've got mostly fresh rock underneath. Um, there are also salts which are derived just from the rock weathering process itself. So we get sodium and chloride arriving from rock weathering as well. So the two sorts of salts accounted for in that, and we need to think about something else as well, and that's what we call marine accession. So uh, particularly in the Pilbara and Kimberley, there, were, there are marine deposits and there are some in southern eastern WA as well. So uh, east of Esperance, we know that we've had what we call marine incursions um, in the last, well, during the tertiary at least. Um, and uh, these have been present over other parts of Australia as well. So uh, 94 million years ago, um, we see the Tethys Sea, uh, which um, created a large marine incursion through uh, northern central Queensland, New South Wales, or where they are now. Obviously, the states didn't exist 94, years, 94 million years ago. All right. Um, so th this is something that uh, is highly relevant to Western Australia because partly we have had a very stable landscape for a long time, uh, and we've got deeply weathered uh, rock 
that has formed regolith on top of the bedrock. Um, there, there are four main requirements for salt to be stored in landscapes. One is that we have a, a stable landscape. So that in Western Australia, for example, we haven't had any glaciers or uh, large marine incursions, dropping sediment or volcanoes to rejuvenate the landscape. Uh, not recently, anyway. There's a little bit of evidence of volcanism um, tens of millions of years ago around Bunbury uh, and possibly uh, along the south coast as well, but not much. Okay, um, So that stability of the landscape allows salt from, for example, rainfall sources to accumulate for a long time, millions and millions of years. We've also got a large pore volume because the rock has been weathered to form this lateritic profile, which Matthias talked to you about. And so what we, we should see is that groundwater is stored in, uh, to a large extent in the mottled and pallid zones, the deeper parts of that regolith. Possibly not the saprolite, the porosity is a bit less there, but in some cases there may be groundwater storage there as well. And of course it will all be salty. We also have low relief in Western Australia. Um, and because of that low relief, we our slopes are not very steep. And so the loss of salt by drainage water, surface drainage, rivers and streams and so forth is minimal. In some cases, uh, relief causes water to actually flow inland and salt accumulates from that mechanism. Many of our salt lakes are um, in what we call the zone of internal drainage in Western Australia east of the Meckering line, so-called. And we also have low permeability, right? So these lower horizons of the lateritic profile are clay-rich, um, and we know that clays have low hydraulic conductivity, and that minimizes the loss of salt by groundwater flow. Okay, so we've got the perfect storm in terms of salinity in a lot of Western Australia. What can we do about it? Well, if it's caused by getting rid of native vegetation, then I mean, it's kind of logical to think that we should be able to put it back, but that's not the whole story. Uh, we need to know the best parts of the landscape to put it back on because we can't revegetate the whole wheat belt, right? People need to make a living from that. We need to grow food and, and so on. So there are a lot of things that we need to consider there. Um, basically, we want to reduce recharge, um, and but we also want to be able to use the fresh water. So there are a couple of things that we can do. We can conduct agroforestry, so sacrifice some agricultural land to trees, uh, which have deep roots and grow all year round, or we can try and get rid of some of the water that falls on the landscape and doesn't infiltrate into the soil. So the runoff is captured um, and we stop it from going to the low-lying parts of the landscape. We redirect it using drains and ultimately into streams and rivers. Okay. So if we look at a, a landscape cross-section, um, here's where the salinity would occur in the low-lying areas, which are going to intercept the raised water table, or aquifer as it's called in this diagram. And the other place that we'd mainly find salinity is where we've got some barrier to water flow. So for example, a, a zone of hard rocks that could be something like a dolerite dike which stops the lateral flow of water and causes saline water to well up to the surface right the water is getting in in what we call the recharge areas the upslope areas um, infiltrating here and the water travels uh, across the surface or subsurface in the soil and uh, causes salinity in these low-lying areas right so we want to plant trees over here not necessarily down here. You might want to plant trees in the lower part of the landscape just to re resist erosion. Okay, so revegetation um, might be effective in our recharge areas or in banks of slope, but is unlikely to be effective for salinity control if we plant trees in a discharge area because the infiltration at that stage has already occurred. All right. So I mentioned deep drains before. Um, you've got a problem with deep drainage, of course, so you need to know what to do with the salty water once you've captured it with drainage. Um, but that's together with revegetation, maybe a way that we can use it. But there, there are some, some issues in that also the response of groundwater to any change is slow. So local groundwater, uh, the response time may be of the order of decades. Um, Regional groundwater, 
so across a large area, a shire or something like that, uh, the groundwater response may be centuries and probably we're dealing with some intermediate phenomenon uh, in remediating salinity in Australia where the response time, if we fix it, if we plant enough trees to fix the problem, we may not even see the response for one or two hundred years. All right, so there we have it um, and a summary of this lecture. Remember that the movement of water in soils can be understood, and this is from the previous lecture, if we think about the combination of different potentials. Water will move so that it minimises its total potential. And water is just about always moving through soils or um, up and down in soils. The rate of water flow, as we've seen from Poisson's law, depends on pore size um, and uh, water content of soil as well. And we can summarise all that in the concept of hydraulic conductivity, which is a number which is uh, tip. Well, I guess characterizes any one particular soil um, in terms of the rate. Whoops, a rate of water movement. Okay, and that's uh, one of the parameters in Darcy's law, which is a useful equation to help us understand water movement through soil and what controls it. Infiltration is the rate of water movement into the soil surface. Um, depends mostly on texture and structure, as does the hydraulic conductivity, uh, but in early stages will also reflect um, other things as well. And soil salinity is an issue related to water balance, specifically the balance between infiltration of water into the soil and recharge and evapotranspiration, uh, that's water use by plants or evaporation from the soil surface. Okay, if you want some references for this, uh, those are some textbook related ones here. Pause it here if you want to copy them down. Or uh, some other more technical references here. And there's where we'll leave it.